audience engaged. At least, that's what most studios think. Transformers The Last Knight made very little money in the United States, and heck, do you remember Jupiter Ascending? What about Valerian? Summer blockbusters with a lot of flair, but no character or emotion to carry that flair, to make all the spectacle worth it. Today on Why It Works, we're going to talk about the Marvel Cinematic Universe's best practical set piece, and that's the Air Force One rescue in Iron Man 3. Now, if you want to write a set piece that bolsters audience entertainment and provides thrills, you need to make the audience care for the characters in the situation, or at least make them care about what the characters care about. There's obviously a lot more things that go into it, but another aspect you can add to an action set piece that helps provide enjoyment to the scene is the time limit, as I like to call it, and this adds tension. <sighs> so we're recording. All right. That's what I think. wearing jeans on my... <laughs> he said it was okay, man. He All thought right. he thought that was some crazy neat freak. He's like, okay if I wear jeans on your couch? I'm like, yeah. what? <laughs> Today we were gonna we're gonna talk about uh, more specifically. No, what am I saying? Today we're gonna be talking about Iron Man three. <laughs> I was able to go to California because I took part in an art competition called Paint One, and it's really cool, and this isn't a sponsored video or anything. I just want to tell you artists out there that if you like challenging yourselves and having fun competing against friends to grow, then definitely check Paint One out. Now, the story of Iron Man 3 is one of Tony Stark facing his personal demons head-on. His PTSD from the Avengers has him worried that an enemy force as powerful as aliens will attack the world, and he has to defend it. He builds all the Iron Man suits in the film as a precaution and this affects his social life. One thing the movie excels at is having Tony face tremendous pressure and end up all alone, and it's a journey of self-discovery that he goes through to find out who he is and to discover what he can do. And I noticed this when I first watched the movie, is his name tag in the beginning of the movie says, you know who I am. Right. And I was like looking at this like, wait, that's gonna probably be part of the theme of the movie because like everybody else knows, like, do they know who he is? Does he know who he is? Because when the kid shows up and, well, who are you, what are you doing here, looks over the kid, the, the, the suit, goes, oh, it's Iron Man. Saying that, that, guy, uh, that the suit is, is Iron, Iron Man. Man, not you. And then goes to him and says, yeah. oh, you, you're dead. Because, like, oh, he totally yeah. died in his And he house. calls himself, like, the mechanic. You're a mechanic, right? Right. You said so. Why don't you just build something? The Mandarin also comes into play in the movie. Now in the comics, the Mandarin is this Asian supervillain. He has ten rings which give him these mystical powers, but in the movie it's revealed that Aldrich Killian is actually the Mandarin, and actually this dude, Trevor, was playing as the Mandarin. Now Killian's plan is to attack Air Force One and capture the President for his end goal. And Killian actually has a brief past relationship with Tony Stark in the 1990s. It's the saying, we create our own demons in the most dramatic way possible. So the Tony in 1999 was an asshole, and he was being an asshole to Killian. That pretty much created Killian and, and his and his motivation. They showed how he grew. He still got to deal with the consequences of how he acted in the past, when he was an extremely flawed character. Yeah. But as I looked out over that city, nobody knew I was there, nobody could see me, no one was even looking. I had a thought that would guide me for years to come. Terrorism isn't just something that happens like abroad, it happens here. The Mandarin, and it's this mm -hmm. foreign dude, but it's actually this random white guy. We don't get demonetized if we say that word, right? <laughs> Muted out. <laughs> okay. So, the plane scene. This henchman called Savin takes the Iron Patriot armor and gets onto Air Force One. He traps the staff in a room and places the Iron Patriot armor on the president and it flies away with him. We also have Tony on his way to the plane. So this is the setup. The staff is trapped, Savin is looming around the plane, and Iron Man is on his way. Unbeknownst to everyone except Savin, Savin has a bomb placed on the plane in case Iron Man arrives. Now the scene begins. Iron Man attacks Savin and pins him to the wall. The President! Savin starts using his extremist abilities to mess up Tony's suit and detonates the bomb, which opens a hole in the plane, sending the staff hurling out. So we get this great shot which showcases not just the velocity of the plane, but how many people are in danger. But Tony still needs to deal with Savin, and now we have a time limit. Tony has a limited amount of time before the Air Force One staff falls to their deaths, and at the moment, he's too preoccupied. Adding a time limit helps engage the audience, as pressure is put on the protagonist and things have to be done quickly to succeed. In short, 
it creates tension. To get away, we get this great shot of Tony shooting at his chest beam, which blasts through Savin, and we follow the blast for a quick second to showcase the speed and intensity of it. Walk away from that, you son of a bitch. The shaky camera tracking the blast and then quickly turning back to Savin adds a rawness to the scene that wouldn't have been there if the camera just stayed static. Right after this, Tony flies outside immediately. How many in the air? Thirteen, sir. How many can I carry? Four, sir. This statement adds to the tension. The character now has to use his intelligence to get out of the situation, but he has to think fast to be able to save the entire staff, as again, we have a time limit. What really helps with this scene is that it was actually done practically. People had to be thrown off a plane to do this stunt. I know the Red Bull skydiving team, let's do a test. I don't believe a lot of people thought it could be done practically, and I'm like, I know we can do this for real. Similar to the Mission Impossible Fallout jump, just not as specific as that one had to be shot to make it seem like it was one take, the Iron Man 3 plane jump was written by, I'm pretty sure, Shane Black, and a lot of work went into the scene, including testing the jump multiple times, and including hidden parachutes in the outfits of the jumpers, so that if something goes wrong, there's a safety. The background then gets replaced digitally, and the footage is composited together. Iron Man is also replaced digitally, of course, and since hands are difficult to track when replacing the body double with the Iron Man suit, the hand has to be replaced as well, and you have the scene. I was talking about this yesterday when I was watching Indiana Jones. When sequences are done, or practically, there's like a certain charm and care put into each of the shots. Whereas it has to be perfect. When directors do things practically like that, that's more indicative of how they are as a director. Where they put care into those sequences that don't last very long. The velocity and rush you get from this is near impossible to fake. Shots like these you just can't get from a green screen. And while of course some shots were done afterwards and post to make everything fit, most of the scene is done practically, and it's a stunt so wild it's almost unheard of in a superhero film. And Marvel knew this. It marketed the scene heavily, almost as if shocked and excited that they were adding something so spectacular to their cinematic universe. The constant shots that start from the sky and then rotate towards the ground tracking the characters really helps emphasize the speed at which the characters are going. I feel like the visceral nature of this scene is all black. Again, like I said, I think Shane Black wrote this scene, and Shane Black loves to portray violence and tension in this raw way, as messy as it is. Take this scene from The Nice Guys. Very clever, Holly. I thought so. <gasps> Why did you just throw cold coffee on me? I like where your head's at, sweetheart. That really could have worked out. Things don't go as expected. Now take this scene from Iron Man. The prodigal son returns. Whatever. It seems as if he does his best to remove cliches from his movies, and if cliches have to occur, then he exaggerates them to an almost parodical degree. Shane Black directs fighting in a very like messy way, so it looks less like a dance and more like an actual brawl. You know, people yeah, are getting hurt. It looks more of... real, like in the movie <clears throat> Kiss Kiss Bang Bang when he's getting his ass kicked. It's just very real. And that's the thing is, The Nice Guys was one of my favorite movies, and I didn't even realize it was directed by Shane Black. Yeah, no, yeah, and that's then good, man. When I rewatched Iron Man three, I was like, wait, let me let me dive into the director, and I typed it in. And I was like, holy shit, like I, I love these movies. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. We also get this great shot, which shows where the characters are in relation to the plane they just dropped, and it's a great moment to pause after such intensity, as if the movie is giving us a moment to take a breath, and then boom, let's save the rest. Things that create tension in the scene are the music, composed by Brian Tyler. It's pulsating until the scene ends. We have Tony constantly talking to the people in danger, and the shots in which we see Tony's face helps display the emotions that are going through the character. The staff is also screaming as they're falling, of course, and Jarvis is also constantly stating their altitude in relation to the ground, emphasizing the time limit. 10,000 feet. 6,000 feet. Eventually, of course, Iron Man saves the day. Now, the scene is just another addition to the film. It's another set piece which is fun to watch, but on the larger scale of things, the scene showcases why Tony Stark is Iron Man. He doesn't resolve things with just his power, it's his intelligence that saves the day. That's what Harley tells Tony. That's what Tony tells himself at the end of the movie, finally having realized this again. If you notice in the movie, Tony doesn't get out of a situation by shooting harder and flying faster. He uses his intelligence every single time. Even when the Mandarin attacks his home, his suit isn't fully operational, so he has to think his way out of danger. When he gets attacked by this smoking hot lady, he has to think his way out and blow her up. 
The entire premise of the movie is, who is Tony Stark? Well, Tony Stark is Iron Man. It's not that he has to be in a suit to become a hero. It's that he can make the suit and become a hero. I think Tony said it best himself. You can take away my house, all my tricks and toys. One thing you can't take away, I am Iron Man. Anyways, guys, that was the video. I hope you really enjoyed it. I really want to thank Joey Salitz for inviting me into his home and being in the video and not abducting me or anything. Yeah, your battery's dying anyway, so oh, we have yeah, no choice. Right. The living meme, Joey Salitz. The living everyone. meme. Nice to meet you, man. I want to thank Paint One for flying me out to LA in general. And again, if you're an artist, check out the Paint One tournament. I'll talk about it in my LA vlog video. And lastly, I really appreciate the support. Likes and shares are especially appreciated. Thank you so much, patrons. Especially Jonathan Baldi, who has really, really helped the channel. It's absolutely amazing. I'll try to make my content as spicy as possible for you guys. Anyways, thank you all for watching the video. Thank you guys for coming to the table. And I'll see you all next time.